welcome. My name is Sergey Sekalenka. I am a product manager at the Google Cloud. And today with me, I have uh, George Helios, Vice President to Sigma, talking to you about advancing serverless data processing in cloud data flow by separating state and compute storage. But before we talk about separating compute and state storage, I wanted to do a very, very quickly a historical retrospective of how the industry used to process really large data sets in the past. Imagine it's the year 2000, and you have a one petabyte large data set that you want to process. Well, who am I kidding? In the year 2000, a really large data set was probably something you measured in terabytes. Well, still, you have a terabyte of data, and you want to process it, and it's the year 2000. So you'd probably use something like this, uh, an architecture something like this. You would use a large box with lots of CPU and with some, might be a mainframe or a Unix box, and uh, uh, the storage would be uh, provided through a storage area network. Then come 2004, new distributed processing frameworks were released, and, uh, and now you would probably be using a cluster of cheap uh, Linux nodes with storage actually be, being part of that processing node, so local storage. Then as things moved into the cloud, uh, you were still using these clusters of Linux nodes, but now you would be using uh, network attached storage provided by the cloud provider. In 2010, Google published a white paper. We called it the Dremel paper, which defined the new architecture for processing really large web scale data sets. And that architecture was based on the following idea. You would have a independent, highly available cluster of compute, and you would have highly reliable storage uh, facility. In 2011, uh, we launched a product that was based on this uh, white paper, on this concept. Uh, we called it BigQuery. And probably at this conference, you've heard about BigQuery many, many times. It became a very successful product. So this is the architecture of uh, BigQuery. It has the concepts described in the Dremel white paper. It has a replicated storage uh, layer. It has a highly available cr cluster of compute. They're separate, they're working together, and they're connected through a very fast petabit scale network. But there's a component in this architecture that was not part of the original Dremel paper. It's the distributed in-memory shuffle tier. Now, you might ask yourself, what is this shuffle? Why, why was it uh, added later on uh, when, when we actually launched the product into general av availability? So let's just quickly cover the concept of shuffle. Uh, with shuffle, uh, or in data processing, when you have uh, a collection, a big collection of key value pairs, uh, and you want to do a grouping, or, grouping or a join with another data set, you need to sort these elements. And when you have a single node processing architecture, uh, you can easily sort it, more or less, either in memory, you can sort your data set in memory by key, or you have uh, on-disk efficient on-disk sorting algorithms. Unfortunately, when, uh, once your data sets explode and you have to move a, to a distributed framework or distributed architecture where you have lots of nodes, uh, it becomes somewhat more complex. So you, uh, your end goal is to have everything sorted by key and all data elements associated with a particular key collocated on a, a particular worker node. And what you end up doing is you end up shuffling or physically moving data elements associated with specific keys from one box to another. And that's the process of shuffling. Now, as you can imagine, this is a very resource-intensive and time-intensive process. And as your data sets scale, it becomes uh, more and more complex. That's why BigQuery uh, ended up building a separate dedicated component that was just responsible for shuffling big data sets. And it uh, became critical, uh, a critical component that connected the storage as well as the uh, compute, uh, compute nodes. Now, I am a product manager of Dataflow, and this is a Dataflow-related question, so you might ask yourself, why am I spending so much time talking about Shuffle? Uh, we actually, in Dataflow, have, have the same problem. Uh, we are providing 
the same uh, data uh, transformations to customers. We allow them to do groupings and joins and aggregations and filtering and projections. So uh, the problem set is actually quite similar to what uh, BigQuery is dealing with. Here's a screenshot of a uh, real data flow pipeline. And let's just follow this pipeline as it uh, lives in our service. Simplistically, it can be represented by this diagram. Uh, we have a couple of data sources. We have data transformations. That's the green things over there. Uh, and then we have uh, group uh, joins and group buys. That's a special kind of a data transformation. Uh, and finally, the data ends up in a data sync. So as you submit this data flow job to our service, Cloud Data Flow, uh, we are going to create a cluster of nodes to process it. And these will be uh, compute engine virtual machines. And we'll also use uh, persistent disk storage. <clears throat> and we're going to start reading from sources. Uh, once, we, once we hit the green boxes, the data transformations, <clears throat> we're going to run them uh, on compute uh, and use some local storage. <clears throat> and then when things uh, enter the, the joints and the group buys, we're actually going to do a shuffle. And we're going to do this shuffle today using persistent storage, either the, uh, the magnetic type or SSD type, uh, whatever the customer specifies. Ultimately, data gets written into sinks, and we shut down the cluster. And that's kind of, in, in a nutshell, how a data flow job works. Now, in data flow, as I said, we, we are dealing with the same kinds of uh, uh, volume and scalability issues that BigQuery is dealing with. Uh, we have huge volumes of data that customers want to process. And so we ended up uh, implementing a very similar mechanism for a distributed in-memory shuffle service in Dataflow. And the service works like this. Uh, you have your compute clusters, and they run your user code, uh, which you write either in Java or Python. Then we have the Dataflow shuffle. And the Dataflow shuffle is deployed for... Uh, uh, high, uh, high availability reasons into multiple uh, GCP regions. So in each GCP region where data flow shuffle is available, we also have replication uh, and duplication of uh, shuffle in, uh, in every zone. We have it deployed in every zone. We have a component we call the auto zone placement, and this component decides based on the available capacity and the job uh, which zone it needs to be assigned to. So we take care of uh, deciding which, uh, which zone to run. Uh, and then we have a, uh, uh, a trio of components which coordinate the actual shuffle uh, operation uh, among themselves. We have a shuffle proxy, which accepts the job. Uh, and we have two memory systems. Uh, uh, one is a, uh, I'm sorry, we have two file systems. One is in memory, and the other one is on disk. And so if your job and the available capacity kind of allows us to, to do a shuffle entirely in memory. Your data will never touch disk and will quickly return results to you. Uh, but if your job is size such as that we, that we have to uh, cache some of this data on disk, we're going to transparently uh, move some of your uh, data from in memory into disk and then shuffle it there. For you, you don't have to worry about anything. We do transparent uh, shuffling and we just return results to you. So this entire architecture requires no code changes from users. Uh, you can tell us just by specifying a parameter that you want to use uh, the data flow shuffle. And we are going to switch from the uh, PD-based shuffle, the one that we discussed just earlier in the, in the talk, to a service-based shuffle, transparently to you. Now today I'm very happy to announce general availability of data flow shuffle in two GCP regions, in US Central 1, and US West one. Dataflow Shuffle has been in beta for, for a while. Now it's available uh, generally to, uh, to all our users. Let's quickly go through the benefits of uh, Dataflow Shuffle. The first benefit is um, many of our customers tell us that Shuffle is now much faster than it used to be. So if we, if we take the same pipeline uh, and compare the execution times of this pipeline uh, using magnetic disks, ma magnetic PD, then SSD PD, and the uh, data flow shuffle, the shuffle service, uh, you're going to see that the kind of magnetic disks give you maybe 55 minutes of uh, duration in your pipeline execution. Now, the tuned pipeline, the one that is using SSD PD, 
SPDs, uh, persistent disks, uh, will run uh, in approximately 17 minutes. The uh, data flow shuffle one will actually run in 10 minutes. Uh, these results are not always applicable to every use case, but many, many of our customers are telling us uh, that's what they're seeing. The other benefit of data flow shuffle is that we are now able to process and shuffle much larger data sets. And you're going to see in a demo uh, the sizes of shuffles we can, we can now support. The pre if previously the untuned uh, jobs, the ones that used magnetic uh, disks, um, were able to, to shuffle tens of terabytes of data, and uh, jobs that used SSD PDs uh, were able to shuffle up to 50 terabytes of data. Now we can push into hundreds of terabytes. So with this, I, I wanted to show you a demo that actually runs a shuffle job. Uh, and here's how the, the job looks like. I have two inputs, uh, two GCS buckets, uh, or, or a data set in, in GCS buckets. And I'm going to read a 50 terabyte data set in each case, in each of the inputs. Uh, and I'm going to join them and uh, write them into a GCS bucket. Uh, the code for this pipeline is written in Scala uh, using um, a framework that one of our customers developed. It's called Shio. Uh, Spotify are the original developers of this uh, uh, framework. Uh, and I like Shio because it allows me to very easily define my, my pipelines. Uh, the entire pipeline is, uh, is, is these 10 to 15 lines of code. Uh, for those of you who uh, might not see it, let me just quickly explain what it does. Um, in the main function, I define my first input and my second input, and then I do a left out or join and I write the, uh, the write output to files. That's all this pipeline does. Uh, and let me switch to the demo station and actually show you. Oh, uh, sorry, before we switch to the demo station, uh, you might ask me uh, yourself, uh, how, do, how does the input look? Uh, here's a screenshot of, the, of one of the files that I will be joining. It consists of uh, three columns. Uh, the first column is the key. That's the key I want to join on. And it's uh, just random generated uh, strings. Then I have a uh, record ID, and I have billions of records in my data set, and so this record ID is pretty long. It's a uh, very long string. And then I have the payload, the value that I want to associate with the key. And so with this, uh, let's switch to the demo station and let me run a few commands. Great, so I'm in, uh, in Bash, in Terminal. And I've got, um, uh, the first thing I want to show you is the contents of my uh, bucket from which I will be reading files. Uh, I've defined a, a variable, a bash variable, input 50 TBs. And this is, the, uh, this is the bucket that contains 50 terabytes worth of files. So I have 50,000 one gigabyte large files that have data with random uh, keys that I will be joining together. And just to show you uh, how, uh, that this bucket really contains 50 TBs, I ran a, um, a listing command, and uh, here's, my, here's my proof. It does really contain 50 terabytes. I'm not going to run now, because if I, if I ran it, then listing 50,000 files will actually take several minutes. Uh, that's why I ran it before. Now, uh, my next command is the one that will create the pipeline. And I'm going to be using the Scala build tool to quickly execute uh, from the command line the command that launches a data flow job. And as you can see, what I need to specify here is what is my input, and, the first, uh, and both of the inputs will be uh, reading from the same bucket, the output bucket, and the parameter instructing the data flow service to use the, uh, the shuffle service. So I'm going to run this command. And so within a minute or two, uh, the, the code will be packaged, all of the dependencies will be deployed, and I'm going to initiate my job. I'm going to give it a few seconds, depending on the Wi-Fi gods. If, uh, if you're lucky, it will, um, it will be done quickly. But in any case, I also ran a shuffle just before the demo, a shuffle that did 100 terabytes of, uh, that processed 100 terabytes. 
So here's my job. Just to give you a few um, data points about this job. The job took 500 billion elements in my data set. It was about 51 terabytes. In the second input, I had also 500 billion rows, another 51. And then I joined them in this operation. In data flow, we call joins co-group by keys. And so it created uh, 100, I think, billion uh, combinations of these keys. Some of the keys overlapped, some of them didn't. And then I uh, wrote them out into files. And I actually created 2.5 trillion lines in my output. 2.5 trillion, uh, almost one petabyte of outputs. And this job took about seven and a half hours and I was able to process it uh, with 10 lines of code. Back to my slides, please. So hopefully I was able to show you that um, now it's very, very easy to, uh, to do large-scale shuffle processing with cloud data flow. In addition to my 100 terabyte run, I also ran a few smaller jobs, just to show you the scalability of this process. So I did a 4 terabyte run, a 20 terabyte run, and the 100 terabyte run, uh, with 5x data increase every time. And the execution time was pretty much linear, uh, which, which is what we want to have. Uh, you don't want to have a quadratic escalation of your duration. Uh, if you can achieve linearity and execution time, that's a very, very good result. Uh, what you don't see on this slide uh, is that the uh, resources that you consumed during this execution, uh, what we call uh, sh um, shuffle uh, data processed, also scaled, uh, scaled linearly. So you'll be, uh, if, if your difference in data is, uh, you know, 2x, you will only pay 2x more for such a job. It's another good property of, uh, of a service if you're able to scale both duration as well as uh, cost linearly uh, as your data pro progresses. Now, we talked about batch pipelines. And uh, hopefully I was able to show you that in batch processing, being able to, uh, to do efficient shuffling is important. But what about streaming processing? Cloud data flow provides both batch and streaming capabilities and Perhaps in streaming, you also need uh, shuffle, you, you might ask. The answer is yes. You, it's, it's also very important to be able to do shuffling in streaming pipelines because customers want to join and group data elements. But in addition to shuffling, in streaming pipeline, the other thing that is important is that uh, you need to be able to efficiently store state. State as it relates to uh, windows, uh, time windows that you create when you run windowing aggregations uh, on streaming data. So let's go through a similar life of a, of a pipeline, but for, for a streaming uh, use case. So this pipeline reads from PubSub, does a windowing operation by event time, does a grouping, does a group by, uh, does an aggregation account, account operation, and then writes into BigQuery. Now the first thing to know here is that when, when you submit such a, uh, such a job to Dataflow, we're gonna divide it into three stages. Everything that comes before the group by, everything that comes uh, uh, after the group by, and the actual uh, shuffle step. And once we divide it into three portions, we're gonna start thinking how do we scale and distribute this processing? And our way of uh, distributing the, uh, the incoming workload to multiple workers is by partitioning your data set by key. If your pipeline already has a key, through maybe a group by operation, we'll use that key. If it doesn't have a group by, then we'll auto-generate a key and partition your data that way. So in this case, for example, uh, we have split the uh, key spaces for the three, uh, for the um, uh, pre-shuffle and the post-shuffle operations into ranges. And we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you next what we're gonna do with these ranges. Well, they're going to assign them to workers. So each key range will be assigned to an individual worker. Once we've done the assignment of key ranges to workers, we are going to persist 
the data and make uh, specific PD volumes responsible for storage of data as they relate to these key keys uh, and, and, and key ranges. When we have to scale a pipeline in a streaming case, we're actually going to move an entire disk from one worker to the other. We're not going to try to rearrange key spaces and compress them or reassign them. We're going to take an entire disk, an entire persistent uh, disk, and reassign it to uh, uh, another worker. As you can imagine, it's a, another time-intensive uh, operation. Streaming auto-scaling has been working for many customers really, really well, but in some cases, it might end up uh, being a little bit sluggish because we have to uh, reassign disks. Now, we talked about group by. Let's quickly cover the windowing operation. And here, it's important to remember, in streaming, there are two important time dimensions that you want to think about. The first time dimension is your business time dimension. That's the event time. This is when the sales transaction happened, if, you, if you're dealing with uh, sales transactions. Uh, or it might be the time when the user clicked on a link. So it's the business time. And in, in our terminology, we call it event time. The other important time dimension is uh, processing time. That's the time when the business transaction enters the processing pipeline. And as you can imagine, there could be delays between a, an event generated by the source system and this same event entering a processing pipeline. Now, what many customers want to do, they don't want to deal with processing time as a unit of analysis or as a dimension of analysis. They actually want to, to deal with event time. And they want to organize the data elements into windows, uh, windows of uh, uh, either fixed uh, duration or configurable duration or session-based windows. But they want to group their data elements by event time. So with this in mind, what we have to do on the data flow side to allow such an, uh, analytic, analytical processing, we end up buffering data elements on, on disk. Because we have to store these elements until the window closes, closes and we can initiate the processing of elements in the window. So in addition to shuffle, we also, do, uh, we also store uh, data elements related to, to windows. So we asked ourselves, can we do something similar for streaming pipelines as we did for the batch pipelines with Shuffle? And the answer is yes. I'm happy to announce that today uh, we made the streaming engine available in beta in two regions, in US Central 1 and Europe West 1. Quickly about the benefits of the streaming engine and the architecture of the streaming engine. Your user code the code that you write that represents your business logic continues to run on worker nodes. But now all the plumbing, all the streaming plumbing that used to run or, and core run and coexist with your user code that used to run on the worker nodes, it has been moved to a dedicated service in Google's backend. And it is responsible for two things. It's responsible for Windows state storage as well as for streaming shuffle. Your user code communicates transparently. You as a developer, you don't have to think about it or worry about it. Um, very similarly to Dataflow Shuffle and Batch case, you only have to provide us with a parameter that tells us that you want us to use the streaming engine. So your user code transparently communicates with this backend, and we do all the shuffling and all the state storage for you. The benefits are we don't have to move around disks anymore if you want to scale. So auto-scaling in streaming became much, much better. We also can do maintenance on our service much easier. Uh, it doesn't interrupt you. You can continue running your pipeline. We can do maintenance and patches on the back end without interrupting you in most cases. And we also consume less resources on the worker nodes. So now your user code that, does, uh, that implements business transactions and does, uh, processes your data elements has more CPU and memory available to it. So it can uh, produce more and uh, crunch through more data. Here's an example uh, that shows you how streaming auto-scaling works together with the streaming engine. And what this diagram shows you is a uh, incoming, streaming, uh, incoming stream of data 
uh, that ran for about one hour and ranged in bandwidth uh, uh, and throughput between one megabyte per second to 10 megabytes per second. When I didn't use the streaming engine, Cloud Dataflow scaled my workers, and initially it started with three workers, and then once uh, once Dataflow sensed there's an uh, increase in, in incoming data, it scaled the number of workers to 15. It kept this number for a while and then scaled down and then waited for another spike in inputs and then scaled up. Now, if you compare this graph to the graph with, uh, with the streaming engine, as you can see, we used less workers and we were able to scale down much faster. Uh, here are the two graphs overlaid and it shows you quite nicely how the streaming engine is able to um, avoid scaling down to high numbers of uh, resources, is using less resources, and is also more responsive to variations in uh, incoming data rate. Of course, the best stories about data flow I to uh, are told by our customers. And so I'm very happy to invite today George Helios from Two Sigma who will be talking to you about how Two Sigma is using Cloud Dataflow. Thanks, Sergey. Uh, so my name is George Helios. I'm a vice president at Two Sigma. Um, so just a quick intro to who Two Sigma is. Uh, we're a Manhattan-based hedge fund. Uh, we take a scientific approach to investing. We hire scientists, mathematicians, uh, engineers, the works, uh, our mission is to find value in the world's data. So in particular, I head our engineering group that deals with granular economic data. Um, I'm probably getting some squints for most of you, so let me explain what, what that kind of means. Uh, here's an example. The NOAA publishes a wealth of information uh, publicly. There's a weather forecast about all regions of the United States. And so we have a big question. Can we correlate weather activity with uh, you know, regional economics to predict financial outcomes. Um, these are the types of questions uh, data scientists and engineers in my group ask. And so uh, this data tend to be very large. Um, I actually jumped slides a little too quickly, sorry. Um, the, the NOAA data compresses about a terabyte or so, but when you expand it and look at all the rows of data, this is into the hundreds of terabytes. Um, so it's very, very large to make sense of that. So what do we do with all the, this data? Uh, so it, uh, we, we can do a lot of things with this. Like we can do geospatial analysis, uh, aggregate billions of rows of data, terabytes of data, ultimately to build alpha models. So this type of work is you know, very lucrative. It's very satisfying. Uh, However, there's a weakness there. We get a lot of our data from third-party vendors. And so we're at risk of bad vendor data causing bad predictions. So at Two Sigma, we take data quality very seriously. Uh, we build in anomaly detections into all of our pipelines uh, to guard ourselves against these uh, bad outcomes. Now, when you're dealing with data at this scale, uh, we have to build very complex high-scale systems to detect these anomalies and uh, protect us and our investors. And so this is where um, data flow enters. Um, we really don't want to be in the business of building infrastructure. We'd like to focus our energy on business logic, um, things nuanced to particular vendors and the types of quirks they throw our way. Um, but also, um, you know, we're not a particularly large team. We don't have the resources go Google tends to throw uh, at these infrastructure type problems. So can a team of 10 to 20 engineers deal with 100, 200 terabyte data sets without batting an eye? And so uh, let me take a quick little sidebar here. How many of you know what RFC 4180 is? I'll be surprised to see any hands out there. Uh, so I do, and this is uh, the format for CSV files. These are comma separated values. Um, it's the bread and butter in the industry for how um, files are distributed. Unfortunately, our vendors do not tend to know what that RFC is. Uh, let me show you an example of, of what that really entails. 
uh, and these are, these are real examples, obviously, uh, changed for presentation purposes. So that comma, is that separating two numbers, or is that 15,600? Uh, in this case, it was actually 15,600. Um, good luck to the pipeline understanding that. Uh, within the same file, dates represented in different ways. Uh, here is a new line character. Is that a separate row, or is that the same string that happens to have a new line in it? A lot of these vendors get their data from th uh, third-party sources to them, and they're just passing it along. Um, so if it's unescaped and unquoted, uh, any off-the-shelf CSV parser will choke on this. And here's another one. Uh, we've noticed that uh, oh, as the days and months go by, vendors decide to expose new fields to us. So the schema changes. Um, so imagine you're a uh, data engineer. You're writing a pipeline. And you have your code for doing aggregation. Do you have a line, a conditional in there that says, if date is less than January 1st, 2016, I only expect four rows, right? This, um, all your pipelines would be littered with this vendor-specific logic, and it gets very unwieldy very quickly. So we wanted to take, uh, use this opportunity with a tool like Dataflow to uh, eliminate this problem entirely and get in front of it. So let me show you an example of what that looks like. Um, we built some uh, tooling, which we called the Normalizer, uh, very creative naming we use. Uh, on top of data flow. And the very first step up here um, really involves taking the list of files and a JSON file we call the schema as input. Uh, I'll go into details of what that schema file kind of looks like in the next slide. But it's things like the first field has this name and has this type like string or integer. Um, it has hooks for Python user-defined functions for doing custom things, uh, et cetera. In this second step, we implemented a custom file source. It takes a file as input from GCS, and it turns it into a P collection, which is uh, a beam, Apache beam slash data flow concept, um, a, a P collection of generic type, which is an Avro object that has a schema. Again, we, we want to use open source where possible to leverage the uh, innovations and the contributions of the broader community. Um, so we turn everything into an object of a type. And much later in the pipeline, we split. This, the stuff that goes one direction are all the rows that we successfully parse, that we applied our, our, uh, our logic to normalize and uh, put everything to a schema. And we use the same Spotify library Sergey mentioned earlier, CO, to save it as a parquet file. There's another functionality in there that I particularly appreciate, is that you can say, I want 5 million rows in every single Parquet file, which if, for those of you who have done Spark, that is actually kind of a hard thing to do generally. Um, so when we output our Parquet files and process them downstream, with all the files being very evenly distributed, your processing times, uh, you make much better use of your resources. The other output I want to call out, because this is the hard-earned experience that uh, our data engineering team has built up over time. Um, we output an extra file that includes summary statistics. I'll also show an example of this. Things like the total number of rows, the, the number of error rows that we encountered, and so on. And even more importantly, say you're on support. You get paged in the middle of the night, uh, and there's a failure. Uh, there's a spike in errors. Um, you'd like to have a file you go to that contains all of the rows that you saw that were invalid. Maybe the vendor got bored and wanted to throw a new quirk your way. Um, I'm laughing, but because it's true. It happens. <laughs> uh, and finally, uh, I'm, I'm super proud to announce that a partnership between us and Google, um, we really wanted to get Parquet uh, loading directly into BigQuery, and Google pulled through big time here. So we not only can produce these Parquet files, but we can load them to BigQuery. So imagine having all your raw vendor data in BigQuery to do um, your research on to investigate failures, et cetera. And then if your aggregation is sort of simple or SQL based, you can just let the Google infrastructure handle it for you. Um, furthermore, since these are all open source technologies, Parquet, et cetera, uh, if the data are small, you can feed it into Pandas. If the data are big and nuanced, you can feed it to Spark. Um, we have one thing up front that handles all of this. It's a big deal for us. So here's an example of a schema file I talked about earlier. Um, you know, there's a few different types here. That first one is a date time uh, in a very standard format. An integer 
uh, containing the number of seconds since Unix epoch, January 1st, uh, 1970. Again, very stand, uh, standard convention here. We have a string. Uh, we have a string hash that takes as input another column. Uh, we found that if your primary key or your uh, foreign key is a string, that's very compute intensive to do joins or group buys on. And so with our standard upfront processing, we can hash a string as input and add a new column there. So when it gets loaded to BigQuery, we have the hash as well as the source. And then when we process in Spark, those groups are, are very fast. Uh, and finally, uh, nullability. Um, some fields are optional, and we want to make it clear which ones should be treated as failures. So here's an example of our output. In this summary file, I'm super proud of the, 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 the work the team did because this, this particular vendor gave us uh, over a trillion rows of data, and this is one of our day's worth of delivery. We were successfully able to parse 916 million records, and we did this in a matter of hours on data float, scaled very linearly. There's 185 parquet files. You can kind of see behind the, the circle, they're very evenly sized. This is great for Spark processing, and the error rows is zero because uh, we had no failures that day. Very powerful. So let's tie this all together. Uh, we have the data from the vendor. They give it to us, FTP, S3, GCS, um, carrier pigeon, uh, whatever they want to do. Uh, we first store it in GCS and then process it in Dataflow. Uh, this is where we do our normalization, turn it into Parquet, and output our summary statistics. We then run our ingestion checks. Like I mentioned earlier, we care deeply about data quality in two sigma. And so we do things like fail if we have uh, a spike or a sharp decline in the number of rows processed or the uh, number of errors encountered. Uh, ideally, we have zero errors, but sometimes if you're processing a billion rows, you sort of shrug at five failed rows. Um, that's just sort of the reality of the situation. And last but not least, we load to BigQuery for analysis, research, and uh, further processing. So I do want to highlight some of the high-level benefits we get here. So a small team like ours can process a ton of data with very little effort. In that trillion uh, data, uh, row data set example I told you earlier, we tried it in Spark previously, and it took 1,000 workers two weeks to crank through everything. Uh, and this is a pretty simple algorithm, just parsing strings and turning them into Parquet. In Dataflow, we did the whole data set in one or two days. Um, one other benefit is we don't have to manage any of the infrastructure. Uh, we just sort of write our Beam pipeline and send it to Google. And there's one more thing I want to highlight there. Sergey talked earlier about uh, Cloud Shuffle. We found to just, we should just turn it on. So it, either the data set is small enough to where Shuffle is not invoked. You can see on the UI there's a number of bytes shuffled. Uh, if this number is small, you don't really pay much of anything for it. Um, but when, the when that number is big and your data set is very large, we've seen uh, pipelines take half, uh, much less, uh, time to run, which saves you on compute and storage costs. That's it. Thank you. Uh, but let's wrap this up. Hopefully, we you were able to, to see how having a separate, separate distributed in-memory processing uh, uh, mechanism for shuffle uh, improves the efficiency of, uh, of separating compute from storage. That was key for both batch and streaming pipelines. Uh, we have a, a new service available for you today, Dataflow Shuffle, a new component, sorry, not a new service. We are not launching a new service. Um, so for batch pipelines, we have a new uh, option for you, Dataflow Shuffle, that makes your pipelines run faster, and you are now able to process much larger data sets and shuffle much larger data sets. Uh, for the streaming pipelines, we have the streaming engine, and it uh, improves the scalability of your streaming pipelines. Both of these features are now available in two GCP regions, in U.S. Central 1 and Europe West 1. Thank you very much, and we would be happy to take questions either over microphone or later on uh, after the session. <laughs>